This is going to be the first video in a series of videos that talks about how to check the error assumptions for a linear regression model. When you're building or constructing a linear regression model, there's usually different types of assumptions that we make as we're building the model. The most important assumption is that the structural or, or mean part of the model is correct. So in other words, we're assuming that the expected value of our response vector y does in fact equal x beta, where x is our matrix of regression coefficients, I'm sorry, is our matrix of predictive variables, uh, and beta is our vector of regression coefficients. So that's this assumption right here. If this assumption is not satisfied, then any, pretty much any conclusion that you can draw from the model is going to be suspect and untrustworthy. So that's really the most important assumption that we want to check. We're going to be focusing in these videos on the second set of assumptions right here, the error assumptions. And the assumptions most commonly made about the errors of a regression model are that they are normal with mean zero and covariance sigma squared times identity matrix. Said in perhaps less technical terms, this means that the errors are assumed to be normally distributed, independent, uh, and identically distributed, with mean zero and variance sigma squared. So this one compact statement actually implies four different things. That the errors are normally distributed, that they're independent, they have constant mean zero and constant variance sigma squared, which is why they are identically distributed. And another assumption that we typically make in a linear regression model is that we don't have any unusual observations that are dramatically impacting the fitted model. And this is more of an informal assumption. This is not something that you have to assume in order to build the model. But if you do have these unusual or influential observations, they can have dramatic impacts on your conclusions and on your inference. And so we usually check for them uh, as we're building our model to make sure that we're not making any really odd conclusions. However, as I said, we're going to focus on the second set of assumptions about the errors. Before we start talking more about those, how to check the error assumptions, we need to talk a little bit more about residuals. And the reason for that is because even though we talk about epsilon when we're formulating our model, we never actually observe epsilon. Epsilon is an unobservable quantity. It's not something that we ever observe for any real data set. So in order to check assumptions about epsilon, which is unobservable, we have to base those checks on something that we can observe, which in this case is going to be our residual vector, epsilon hat. You have to be careful here. The residuals are not interchangeable with our errors. They have different properties. However, by making assumptions about the errors, that allows us to derive certain properties about our residuals and then we can look at the patterns that we expect from our residuals and check whether they match what we expected. And what it basically amounts to is that if we expect a certain pattern in our residuals under certain error assumptions, if those patterns are not satisfied, if we don't see those patterns, then we believe those assumptions, the relevant assumptions, are violated from the, er the model errors. And so essentially what we're going to do is we're going to use our residual vector, epsilon hat, as a proxy for checking the assumptions about our actual errors, or actual model errors, epsilon. So let's talk about some facts related to ordinary least squares residuals. So just to be clear here, we are assuming in matrix notation that our response vector y is a linear combination of our regression coefficients, linear combination of our regression coefficients, uh, plus the error vector epsilon. And the ordinary least squares residuals, epsilon hat, are simply the difference between y and our fitted values, where our fitted values are given by multiplying our matrix of predictor variables, x, capital X, uh, with the estimated regression coefficients beta hat. So this is the, the typical definition of ordinary least squares residuals, never seen it defined otherwise, but you can write it in different ways. There's different ways of formulating it in terms of expression, but this is the basic definition that we always use. Okay, so assuming that we're talking about ordinary least squares residuals, what kind of properties do we expect to see? Well, the first one that we're going to see is that if we assume that our errors have mean zero, we also expect our residuals to have mean zero. 
So when we're checking the mean zero assumption about our errors, we can check whether the residuals appear to have a mean of zero as well. Similarly, if we assume that the variance of our errors are sigma squared times the identity, which implies, by the way, or this is another way of saying that our errors are uncorrelated and have constant variance. Assuming that is true, that means that the variance of our residuals is going to be sigma squared times I minus H, where H is known as the hat matrix and is the product of our matrix of predictors X times X transpose X inverse times X. And actually, I just realized there is a typo there. There should be a transpose after that X. If I can do that, it's not letting me do it. Okay, but there should be a transpose right here. So actually, just to be clear, so it's X times X transpose X inverse X transpose. That is the hat matrix, okay? So please correct that uh, if you were watching this video. So this is actually a very big deal. So even if our errors are uncorrelated and have constant variance, our residuals will not have constant variance and our residuals are also going to be correlated. Okay, so even so our, our residuals here, we see have a very clearly have a different property or different behavior than our errors. So the next fact that we want to look at is that if the expected value of our errors is equal to zero, and assuming that our errors have constant variance and are uncorrelated, then you can show pretty straightforwardly actually that the covariance between our residuals and our fitted values is zero. And when I say zero here, I'm actually talking about an n by n matrix of zeros. So no residual is has any covariance or any correlation between any fitted value for any of the observations. Another important fact is that if our errors have a normal distribution, in addition to having mean zero and covariance matrix sigma squared times identity matrix, then it's very straightforward to show that the residuals also are going to have a normal distribution. And this is simply a consequence of the fact that if a random vector is normal, a linear transformation of that random vector will also have a multivariate normal distribution. And epsilon hat is going to be a linear transformation of the observed data y, right here, and y has a multivariate normal distribution, which implies that the residuals also must have a multivariate normal distribution. Another useful fact is that if we let lowercase xi here denote the values of the ith regressor, so we're not talking about the ith regressor in general, but the actual observed values for the n observed data, uh, for the n observations, the n observed data values, then the covariance between our residual vector and our vector of values for the ith regressor is going to be equal to zero. So there should be no systematic pattern that we see when we plot the residuals against any one of the regressor values. Lastly, as long as the intercept is included in our model, then the sum of our residuals is going to be equal to zero. And this is kind of an interesting thing because it, it doesn't really matter whether our model is a good model or a bad model. As long as the intercept is in the model, this is going to be a mathematical fact that results from performing ordinary least squares regression. So don't let the fact that the sum of your residuals equals zero influence your choice of model or anything like that, because it's going to be true for any model that has an intercept. Before we continue talking about how to check the various assumptions, we need to, we need to introduce a few other things. So one of those things is called leverage values. And the leverage values are the diagonal elements of our hat matrix X, and they're a way of quantifying how unusual the predictor values are for each one of our observations. We're going to let lowercase h of i denote the ith diagonal element of our hat matrix. In other words, if we go to the ith row and ith column of our hat matrix, capital H, that's going to be what we're de we define to be lowercase h of i. That is the ith leverage value. And if we compare what we had on the previous slide, right here, okay, where we derived the covariance matrix of the residual vector, if we think about how we would write the diagonal elements of that, we'll see 
that, in fact, the variance of an individual residual is going to be sigma squared times 1 minus the ith leverage value. Sigma squared times 1 minus hi. So that gives us a way of computing, in theory, the variance of a specific residual. And we can pretty clearly see there that there was the variance of the residuals are not going to be constant because you cannot expect these leverage values to be the same for, for each observation. They could be the same for, for specific ones, but as a whole, you don't expect H1 to equal H2 to equal H3, etc. So this causes a problem because our residuals don't have constant variance. So one of the things that people sometimes do is they compute something called the standardized residual, which attempts to correct for this non-constant variance. So we're going to call this standardized residual, we're going to denote it, I should say. We'll denote the standardized residual by R sub i, and that is uh, obtained by taking the ith residual and dividing it by sigma hat, the estimated standard deviation of our errors, uh, multiplied by the square root of 1 minus hi. So in other words, we're taking the ith residual and dividing by it by its standard error, dividing it by its estimated standard deviation. And this, this fixes the non-constant variance problem. Unfortunately, this has a negative side effect in that the covariance between our standardized residuals and the fitted values is not equal to zero. Whereas for we saw on the previous slide that the covariance between residuals and the fitted values is equal to zero. Uh, when we talk, when we had ordinary least squares residuals, that same fact is not true when we have standardized residuals. Another kind of residual that people often compute, compute is known as a studentized residual, or actually externally studentized residual. Sometimes they call this a jackknife residual or a cross-validated residual, and it looks very, very similar to the standardized residual. However, instead of using sigma hat, when we are trying to rescale our original residual, we instead estimate sigma squared using an estimate uh, ba that's based on fitting regression model without the ith observation. So this is why it's called uh, cross -validation, the cross-validation residual. The idea is that when you want to estimate the, the standard deviation of the errors uh, for the ith observation, you actually remove the observation when you fit your model. You fit the model without the ith observation. You compute the estimated standard deviation of the errors using the other n minus 1 observations. And that's how you actually rescale the residual for the externally student as residual. It would seem on the surface that you'd actually have to fit n different models, one that leaves out each observation in turn. But in fact, using some cool matrix tricks, uh, you don't have to do this. And so you can actually obtain this estimate, this leave one out estimate of the estimated error variance by taking the, the typical error variance, which I should be clear here uh, for those of you who are following this video. So normally we estimate sigma hat squared by the residuals sums of squares divided by n minus p where p is the number of regression coefficients. So that's our typical definition of sigma squared. Or I'm sorry, that's our typical estimator uh, of sigma squared. And what we're going to do is we're going to take that estimate, we multiply it by n minus p minus the square, squared standardized residual, and we divide that by n minus p minus 1. And if you do that transformation, then you actually get the leave one out estimate of the, of the error variance. Uh, for the ith observation. And assuming that the model part of your, the structural part of your model is correct, and assuming that your errors are normally distributed with mean zero and covariance matrix sigma squared times identity, then you can actually show that these studentized residuals have a t distribution with n minus p minus one degrees of freedom. And you can actually use that to derive confidence bounds and things like that, which can be very, very useful. So just to sum up, some of these uh, remaining facts that are these trailing facts that we talked about. So ordinary least squares residuals have non-constant variance, but they are uncorrelated with the fitted values white hat. On the other hand, 
standardized and student, studentized residuals correct the non-constant variance of the OLS residuals, but they are correlated with Y hat. So sometimes people argue strongly for one type of residual over another, but in fact, they each have their own weaknesses. And honestly, in practice, uh, of these different kinds of residuals, of the three kinds of residuals we looked at here, for the most part, they actually behave very similarly, with some exceptions. So you can pretty much use one interchangeably with the others, but if you're ever in doubt, you can always compare the results for one residual with the results using a different residual, and there's really gonna be no loss there. And there are some useful functions in R that you can use to obtain the various quantities that we've talked about. So assuming that we fit a, an R model L mod using the LM function, then the function residuals applied to the L mod object is going to return the ordinary least squares residuals. The function R standard applied to L mod will return the standardized residuals. The function R student applied to L mod will return the studentized residuals of the model. And lastly, hat values of L mod is going to return the leverage values for the fitted model.